Coming to you live around the world from NOV's Studio 202, this is Inside Out Horizons. With your hosts, Lydia Mabry, Jeremy Griswold, Cass Casey, and Shelby Dumaine. Now, let's start the show. Hi, and welcome to Inside Out Horizons. My name is Shelby Dumaine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are tuning in from. Welcome to our show. Uh, this, of course, is a show each week where we um, talk to a very interesting person, someone who's an expert in the energy industry, and we bring that conversation live to you um, to get your questions answered and to hear from our guests. And uh, this week, we're very excited. We are celebrating Earth Week. So Earth Day is this Friday. And we really wanted to highlight some stories that we're um, covering how the energy industry is working towards a more sustainable future. And so we thank you for joining us and we're excited. Uh, we have, uh, you know, with, with, with wanting, keeping that in mind, we have a really great topic today. We're talking about the role of hydrocarbons in the energy transition. So we have a really excellent show. And before I bring out our guest, I actually want to bring on uh, Ben Lasher. He is going to tell us how you, the audience, can get involved in the show live right now. Hello, yeah, ben. so um, there, uh, we encourage people to get involved. It's an interactive show. So um, there are a couple different ways you can do that. You can leave comments on, on LinkedIn or on YouTube. I'll be following along uh, throughout the show. And, um, and hopefully we can get some of those questions answered for you uh, live by our guest. So back over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Ben. And I always love to see, too, if, if you're watching and want to let us know where you're tuning in from, that's one of my favorite things to see, too, is sometimes we get people from Italy, from uh, Saudi Arabia, from all over in the U.S. So really excited to see where you are watching from. And again, welcome. Uh, well, without further ado, I'm, uh, I'm very excited to announce our guest today. So we have the program director for the Oil Sustainability Program. Uh, we have Mohammed Altair. Welcome to the show, Mohammed. Hi, Shelby. Um, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you today. Likewise, likewise. And where uh, can you let us know where you're you're joining from, and also a little bit about um, about you, about Mohammed? Sure. Uh, well, before I, you know, uh, um, I tell you about myself. I, you know, I want to first of all thank you, thank NOV, mm -hmm. thank the NOV Live team. This has been, you know, a great uh, opportunity for us. Uh, and you guys have been great uh, in coordinating everything. So uh, I'm I'm speaking to you uh, from Riyadh. Um, it's 4:30 p.m. here in the afternoon. Uh, so great to be with you again. A uh, little background about myself. Uh, I'm currently the program director for the uh, Oil Sustainability Program. Uh, we call it OSP for short. Um, I spent almost 20 years in Saudi Aramco. Uh, the last uh, two and a half or three years of those, I was seconded uh, to the Ministry of Energy to work on this program. Um, so it's in my DNA now. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering uh, from Vanderbilt uh, University uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. I also have a master's uh, in engineering and management from uh, MIT. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of my career working on different uh, parts of the energy sector, but I'm, I'm, you know, it's 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 been a journey. I'm very passionate about the sector itself, um, and I'm very passionate about the program that uh, I'm currently working in. Um, uh, you know, it's it's coincidental that this is Earth Week, and mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, oil sustainability or hydrocarbon sustainability, and I think that's uh, a, a great opportunity for us to showcase the interlinks. Uh, between sustainability that can come from hydrocarbons. Um, and I just, um, you know, on a personal note, uh, I'm married. I have uh, uh, three girls. Uh, they keep me busy, uh, but they also inspire me uh, to make sure that the things that we're working on uh, will last and and um, and help their generation and, the you know, the generations after um, have a great um, life going forward. So they're really... Uh, kind of the inspiration, the generational aspect of what we're trying to do as a program is, is has always been foundational for me. Uh, we're a long-term program. This has been this is going to be a journey, um, and also as an industry. 
Um, so, I, you know, that's again, really thank you for having me and I'm, I'm looking forward to having a great uh, exchange with you guys and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll come up with some great uh, concepts and ideas together. I agree. And, and, you know, I think that's such a wonderful resume and career you've had, but really what you what you just touched on kind of the mission and, and the, the why behind, you know, why we celebrate Earth Week or why we work towards a more sustainable future and and what OSP is, is working towards is really why we wanted to have you guys on here to, to be able to have that conversation. So thank you as well. And uh, kind of with that, can you let our audience know, um, you know, what is the oil sustainability program? Or you might hear us say OSP. What 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 is it? <laughs> um, well, you know, let me take you a little bit uh, back to 2018 when we kind of started mm -hmm. this idea. Uh, this wasn't my idea. It was, it was the the idea of His Royal Highness uh, Prince Abdulaziz mm -hmm. bin Salman, the Minister of Energy, um, and it was basically the task was in a world where we all understand there is a transition happening. Um, there are multiple uh, aspects that are uh, creating new challenges to the energy sector or the energy ecosystem that we live in. Um, just to name a few, you know, some, some of these things that we considered. So uh, the first one, and it's a major one, it's the consumer. So consumer behavior shifts towards energy products and services is continuously happening. Um, so the idea is what do we need as a sector to do to un better understand the consumer's needs, wants, and how do we create products and services that help consumers thrive in the future? Secondly, is the techno technological um, innovation that's happening, um, which is also creating some interesting dynamics in the sector. So if we look at uh, you know, the transition into uh, electric vehicles uh, that's you know, happening in the mobility space, um, renewables, um, uh, solar, uh, there's a, a wide gamut of um, uh, new energy uh, uh, alternatives that are on the horizon. And we, uh, as a kingdom, having um, a hydrocarbon endowment plus other uh, capabilities in the energy sector, wanted to position ourselves to better understand how we can create opportunities um, from these new um, trends that are happening. And finally, uh, climate regulation um, and, you know, the push for um, you know, trying to improve the and mitigating the emissions that come from the sector um, is also creating a challenge. So with all those uh, things put together, you've probably heard me use the word challenges a lot, <laughs> but we actually uh, in our DNA as a program call them opportunities. So we think fundamentally that from every challenge that we have identified while we were designing this program, and by the way, we spent almost two years working mm -hmm. with every major stakeholder in the kingdom, uh, we also engaged with uh, internal entities, think tanks, academic institutions, research centers, and we also talked with companies uh, to stress test what we're trying to uh, do as a program. So uh, we actually came up with this concept of opportunities, and we have identified more than 80 opportunities that we um, came up with and, and we classified. Um, and we are currently, since we kicked off uh, our efforts in 2020, um, January 2020, 2020 to be precise, us and, and COVID-19 decided <laughs> to start together. Um, uh, we, we actually have been in the implementation phase. So mm -hmm. we've prioritized 46 out of our 80 plus opportunities. Wow. We're focusing on three main demand sectors. Uh, the biggest one is materials, and there's a big uh, effort on uh, the non-metallic space. Uh, the second is transportation. We're looking at uh, uh, road, uh, aviation, and marine. And in road, we're looking at light duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles, and you know, there's a wide spectrum of things mm -hmm. you can do in mobility. Um, and also utilities. Um, what can you do to improve hydrocarbon sustainability in the utility sector? Uh, but before I get into you know, some examples of these opportunities that I've highlighted. I just want to give you a sense of what were the strategic priorities that we depended on as a program right. um, uh, while we were developing this, the, the, you know, the whole concept. So uh, there are three fundamental pillars that we uh, depended on. The first one is development. So the idea here is, you know, there's a, a big part of the world that does not have access to energy. And we in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have an obligation, given our hydrocarbon endowment in terms of uh, the competitiveness of extracting our hydrocarbons and also the environmental footprint advantage that we have. Uh, we are we are we have an advantage uh, 
um, that that and an obligation to parts of the world where we need to avail uh, energy. And that's kind of our our pillar on on development. Um, we think that you can create right infrastructure uh, in parts of the world that don't have this infrastructure and uplift uh, different communities by creating energy uh, access. The second pillar that we depended on was innovation. So um, I cited uh, earlier EVs. Uh, we know that there is a transition happening in the mobility space. Right. We know that there is a transition to electric vehicles. We believe that this transition will and should occur. Mm -hmm. But what we also want to do is focus on the status quo today. Is anybody looking at the internal combustion engine today as it is? We look at it from three different parameters. First of all, and this is just an example, the fuels that go into the engine. Can you make them optimal, more efficient? Mm. Uh, you know, can you blend, create synthetic fuels, uh, et cetera? Um, yeah. And then the engine itself, can you actually uh, modify the components of the engine, you know, come up with a breakthrough technology that makes the engine combust more optimally? Uh, and finally, the emissions that come out, the exhaust right. that come out of the vehicle. That's probably the biggest challenge for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you mitigate, remove uh, this uh, this emission that's coming out from um, uh, you know the vehicle? And that's really how we look at it as a program. While this transition to the uh, electric vehicle is happening, we want to improve vehicles today because it's the majority of um, hydrocarbons that go into this uh, this space. And there's a lot of effort that we're coordinating with different uh, stakeholders in the kingdom and beyond uh, to do this. Uh, one thing I want to highlight as well as a program, we really rely on collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so we collaborate with government entities, with research institutions, academic institutions. Uh, we even go to development banks uh, to really go holistically on addressing the pain points related to uh, the energy sector. Um, and we understand that climate is a challenge. Um, and, you, you know, I, I always uh, tell my team, you know, we all live on this earth together. Uh, we don't have, an, a, you know, any vested interest to uh, damage the, the environment. In fact, it's the, it's the other way around. We have a very strong uh, mandate uh, to be very sustainable in everything that we do. Um, and you'd be really surprised, you know, having a program like us really put a lot of pressure uh, on the opportunities that we push for, um, trying to adhere to the highest standards of sustainability that we can achieve as a program. And I think that is really uh, enriching us um, in terms of a program. It, it, it really gives us the bandwidth to be innovative um, in the technologies that we uh, look at, um, in the applications that we're exploring. Um, and there's a, just a wide spectrum of things mm -hmm. that you can do. Um, and that's what we want to continue doing. We we are still relatively young program. We have mm -hmm. a very large mandate. Uh, we have high aspirations and high ambitions. Um, you know, His Royal Highness, um, the Minister of Energy, is you know our biggest supporter. Um, and and you know I can't do uh, I can't claim any success without his support. Uh, but Absolutely. we also have uh, you know support at the highest level uh, of government in the kingdom. Uh, right. You know, His Royal Highness, uh, the Crown Prince and, and uh, His Royal Highness, the, the King, they created um, a wealth of opportunity today in Saudi Arabia. Um, and we are transforming and living the transformation that we are uh, in today. And we, being the oil sustainability program, believe that we can be part of this transition that's happening and we should be. Uh, and that's really the hope. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, um, if it's all said and done, I can look back and, and look back at the generation of my daughters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I forgot to mention, you know, I have a six month old oh. and she's really the, the, the key um, uh, person for me. And I'm envisioning, you know, the next 20 years of her life, what's going to be the energy landscape uh, and just excites me. So I'm really glad that, um, you know, I'm able to contribute to this program, to, to contribute to the country's um, economic and sustainability um, initiatives, and I love uh, the team that I'm working with. Um, they're they're all passionate and very hardworking, and 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 hopefully we can continue doing that. Yeah, so I mean, there's so much there that it's just so inspiring to hear um, that that you know y'all are working on these initiatives and just all so much in there, like the about 
thinking about how can we optimize, like you said, vehicles nowadays, in addition to the, the EVs coming out, but what do we have now that we can optimize is something I've you know, not heard a lot of people kind of touch on and, and focus on. So that's really amazing. And, and like you said, noticing, seeing these challenges as opportunities. I think that's something from talking to a lot of different uh, SMEs and experts in NOV about our technologies that I think we often do is is look for the opportunities in those challenges. So it's really great. It, it's uh, it's almost like no wonder we're, we're collaborating. I feel like this is a, a match made in heaven. So it was really cool hearing that and, and seeing, you know, somebody else who who cares so deeply about like you said those future generations is is really we do exciting. shelby and thank thank you for highlighting that and that's really something that if you ask anybody in the OS sustainability program mm -hmm. what are they working on they'll tell you i'm working on this opportunity that opportunity wow. and this opportunity that's really the lingo that we follow and it's right. it's our mode of operation and yes i did highlight uh cars but we're also doing the same uh, efforts on aviation. We're doing the mm -hmm. same uh, efforts on marine. Uh, so we think that uh, addressing the challenges related to um, hydrocarbon sustainability across all of those parameters is 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 a, is basically the foundation that we've built this program on. And there are so many things that you can do. And by, by the way, if nice. you look at an airplane, it's not only the jet fuel that goes uh, into the plane, it's also lightweighting opportunities. You can actually right. uh, reduce the weight uh, of an airplane when you uh, introduce uh, some advanced polymeric materials. Uh, I know some some there are other players in the world that are working on this as we speak. Mm -hmm. And this really helps drive your uh, carbon footprint, uh, you know, reduce your carbon footprint. Um, and we are very, by the way, um, excited to explore a lot of these opportunities that don't typically get a lot of attention um, uh, today. Uh, so you'll always see us uh, trying to influence and work on the status quo. What, what can we right. do to improve technologies today, the pain points of today, because we know that the transition is, is going to happen in the future. And one thing just to, to before I, um, uh, you know, I, I go off on another tangent. Um, <laughs> we don't mind. You know, we are, <laughs> a, I, I mentioned that we are a long-term program. Right. We actually did the study based on a 2040 horizon. Wow. So all of the opportunities that we're working on today were based on an outlook of us going and projecting where will we be 20 in 2040. Now we also did the study, you know, before COVID uh, introduced mm -hmm. itself to the world. Right. And this is the beauty of the sector that we're in today. There is so many different dynamics that are happening. Um, and you have to adapt with those dynamics. So today something may be viable, tomorrow it may not, but we don't look uh, for tomorrow. We always look at uh, a very long-term horizon. And this is the beauty of uh, the energy sector and, and you know, pre my previous work in, in Saudi Aramco. We never uh, consider things uh, in a short-term view. We always look at things mm -hmm. at a very long-term view and how we can really improve the, the, uh, the transition uh, where hydrocarbons is, 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 remains and, and will be part of that foundation. Right. It's not just, uh, it's not an either or of you can only look at the future or focus on today. Y'all are kind of taking a two pronged approach of what can we change now that will make a better future that will work towards that, uh, which I think is really excellent. And, and kind of in that same vein, can you talk about what OSP is aiming to achieve? What would you say are the kind of major goals of the oil sustainability program? Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a very, there's a very long answer. There is a very short <laughs> answer. Uh, I'll give you the short answer first. All so right, we are trying to make oil more sustainable. Right. And by that, I don't just mean to, um, you know, uh, increase the, the, the selling oil all over the world. We literally want to make it more sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, our third pillar is actually, how do you create the most economic and environmentally sustainable hydrocarbon uh, opportunity. You know, when, when we launched um, our effort, um, uh, Vision 2030 was on the horizon. Um, uh, back in October, uh, the Crown Prince announced two major initiatives, uh, the Saudi Green mm -hmm. Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative. These are, you know, uh, uh, breakthrough uh, announcements that really give us uh, the kingdom the opportunity to showcase that we are really serious on reaching the climate goals. 
Um, these announcements were just hap you know, just happened. Uh, I think it was October of, of 2021, and, and you'll hear another uh, set of announcement uh, and updates, uh, you know, towards the end of this year. But why are these initiatives important to highlight? Or, and why is, uh, we call them for short, SGI and MGR important to highlight? It's because we have been very clear about our ambition towards climate as a kingdom. So when this uh, energy value chain shift happened uh, back in 2015 during the Paris Climate Agreement, um, there was this sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. There was a sense of um, uh, nervousness that there is a transition that is required. However, this transition needs to happen in a very sustainable uh, manner. So we as a kingdom have been very clear about that. Um, we have, um, I'll just mention a few things to consider, um, you know, just to reflect on the ambition that we've announced. So you've probably heard of Vision 2030. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind Vision 2030 was basically to transform the kingdom from a societal and, and, and an economic uh, point of view. And the, the point related to diversifying the, econ the economy is really foundational for us. We will remain um, supportive and we will remain a, a big player in hydrocarbons and, and mainly oil. Uh, but we will also diversify the country's economy to improve the quality of life of people in the kingdom. Um, another consideration is in, in the sector or the space that we're in, there are uh, there's a, a, a dynamic baseline that we always have to consider, and that is the changing costs um, uh, bases, the changing and shifting technologies uh, that happen, uh, the different scenarios that the world is going through in terms of how um, each part of the world is utilizing hydrocarbons. That's also changing, and that's a consideration that we put in um, uh, our mandate. Uh, and then we have to look at the technological advancements and our technologies maturing at the right pace mm -hmm. uh, to achieve uh, this um, uh, ambition. And, and uh, I, maybe I forgot to mention, during the SGI and the MGI events, we made mm -hmm. a clear announcement that we want to achieve net zero um, emissions by 2060. And that uh, 2060 horizon yeah. is, you know, is closer than you think. <laughs> I mean, we're eight years away from uh, 2030, so I, I don't know. For me, I still get nervous when when these numbers, uh, uh, the, you know, these numbers come about. Uh, but one thing that is very important to consider, and it's also an issue that we launched uh, within the uh, Ministry of Energy ecosystem, uh, is the Circular Carbon Economy National Program, and it's basically a framework that focuses on the four R's: reducing, reusing, recycling, and removing of carbon. And there are multiple things that you can do across each uh, R. Um, and the beauty about the, the framework is that it's really pragmatic in its approach uh, to how we interface with hydrocarbons. Uh, but let's zoom in on the technologies required to achieve your uh, net zero uh, emission target by 2060. Mm -hmm. In our assessment, and also uh, if I reflect on the latest IPCC report uh, that came about, if we want to achieve some of the technology advancement in the circular carbon economy uh, framework, some of them won't be mature until 2040. Mm -hmm, right. And these are things like uh, carbon capture and sequestration technology, direct air capture, um, uh, et cetera. There's a long list of things that uh, need to come about. So we part, another consideration that we have as a kingdom is to invest in accelerating um, carbon capture technologies um, and improve efficiency of buildings and and basically the entire energy ecosystem infrastructure that we're that we have in the kingdom. Why? Because we believe this will reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we also, you know, are trying to shift the consumer in the kingdom. Uh, and what we want to try to push for is creating uh, more emphasis on recycling. Uh, I know it sounds like a you know a, a very simple concept, <laughs> but if, if you really look at uh, the pain point that individuals have and the emotion that uh, people uh, you know uh, feel when they see a plastic bottle in a river or in mm -hmm. an ocean or right. on the street, and then yeah. you start making an association, oh, this plastic is really you know detrimental to the environment and. It's, it's it's killing marine life, et cetera. But let's take a step back and let's think about this plastic bottle and what it's carrying. 
it's carrying water, <laughs> which is a very fundamental life source. So it has a very important utility. Uh, now the issue is consumer behavior usually uh, is not at an awareness where individuals, um, you know, have the awareness to, okay, when I'm done with consuming this plastic bottle, I have an opportunity to recycle it. Mm -hmm. Now, there may not be the right infrastructure where individuals can go, okay, I want to go and, and put it in this receptacle or that receptacle. There may not be companies that uh, are available to help this um, increase the recycling, um, uh, you know, uh, progressing, right. uh, whether it's in the kingdom or in the region or beyond. And I'm just, I'm just speaking, you know, about our model in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So how can we change the mindset of consumers, make them more aware that, okay, this bottle, if it's placed in the right place, can be recycled and reused and removed from um, the, the waste environment and will reduce, um, you know, landfill waste and won't end up in a place where it shouldn't be. So that's one fundamental thing that we're working on in the oil sustainability program. The other thing is, we want to improve um, the economics of recycling. Mm. We want to create uh, a push for closed loop systems across the entire value chain. So one, one of our opportunities, for example, is, is coming up with a concept to replace cardboard boxes in, in online shipments and use uh, a polymer reusable package alternative. Mm. And the beauty with that, and I'll just try to simplify it. So you order something from Amazon you receive a package in a reusable container, let's call it that. Uh, right. You take the product that you bought and then you give the, the, you know, the, the package or the container back to the shipment company. You can actually create a model right. um, and a business around that. Mm -hmm. Instead of you getting a cardboard box, taking it, opening it, throwing it somewhere, it ends <laughs> up in a landfill. Yes, it will biodegrade, but you're just creating a longer term pro uh, problem. Uh, and plus think about the, the, you know, we also look at it from, um, uh, you're reducing the carbon sinks because you're cutting trees to make the cardboard and paper right. products, et cetera. Yeah. So that's just a simple example. And you just need to work with consumers. You need to work with major companies to try to make that uh, marriage happen. So right. closed loop systems, recyclability is very important to us and making sure that we are very closely aligned with the kingdom's overall vision of improving the quality of life um, and, and hopefully trans, transcending all of our efforts across the region and the world. And that's why we have these major Saudi Green Initiative and Middle East Green Initiative initiatives uh, to really showcase to the world that we really mean and we really stand behind our sustainability uh, efforts. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so interesting. You talk about like increasing just consumer awareness as well. I mean, yeah, I think so many people think, well, if it came in cardboard or people are doing more paper packaging, like that must be better, right? You're right, the effect on on trees and, and all the energy that goes into creating that thing. But yeah, I mean, just like you said, something as simple as a reusable box hadn't even occurred to me, but that's genius. So I think that that's so, so cool to hear like those little things that we all could be kind of more conscious of, more aware of. And, and those, you know, the three R's that I think most of us learn and I think four it, oh, hours. Oh, four hours. Sorry. Oh, see, I was about to make a first grade reference, and and there. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's that's so cool to see how. No, but those that kind of fundamentals of uh, that that we learn when we're young are still so important and really can have such a big big effect if you think about and rework them how they can apply. So it's really amazing. And I know you've talked about this, but can you maybe summarize why? what OSP is doing is so important. Why is it important to you? Why is it important to the world? Why should it be important to every person? Um, it's a big question, but I have to ask. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, uh, um, I mean, thank you for that question. I think it's uh, when I reflect uh, personally mm -hmm. on, on my link with hydrocarbons, um, you know, I just look around, right. um, you know, it's a fact. Hydrocarbons are the building blocks uh, for any intermediate or final good that you interact with today. Um, many in many applications like your phone, your laptop, bottle of water, your car, etc. Um, hydrocarbons are infused in, in all of these mm -hmm. things. So for me, I think understanding 
the importance of hydrocarbons in my day to day life is fundamental as a consumer, as a person who is part of this world. Um, now, the, the, I think the key thing that um, maybe I'm biased because I am in the sector, but the key, key responsibility that we have to push for um, as an entire you know, ecosystem of energy sector players, whether you're a service company or you're an oil producer, refining, petchem, mm -hmm. renewable, I mean, and energy is energy. <laughs> right, all of it. You need to really understand what are the uh, environmental advantages that hydrocarbons possess versus alternative uh, materials. And some people don't really uh, realize that. Um, I just want to cite, you know, an example. I'm sorry to, to pick on the pandemic, <laughs> but Shelby, imagine your life in the past two years mm -hmm. without access to, to plastics to help us through this pandemic. Imagine your life mm -hmm. where you don't have masks being able to be manufactured. You don't have the capability to produce sanitizers. You don't have the required fuels to to transport people and goods um, around the world. I mean, just think about mm -hmm. how this pandemic would have been if we did not have hydrocarbons to to be part of our um, uh, support system. Mm -hmm. And you don't really feel it or see it uh, until you realize that in a lot of cases, uh, I would even argue um, our industry saved lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just if you just think about what good we do as a as a, a sector and and what good comes from hydrocarbons, the 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 discussion really shifts. Um, you know, I know we understand that people get emotional towards uh, oil and, and the industry in general. Uh, we understand that. And it's our obligation to try and bring out the things that people don't necessarily see or, or know or, or sometimes, you know, uh, fall through the cracks. Um, and my, my I'm very passionate, as you can tell, um, or I hope you can tell. Absolutely. Uh, about, like, what, about what great. we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do believe that what we did during the pandemic, and there are live examples, real efforts within at least the Ministry of Energy that we were that we were responsible for, that really helped um, different parts of the world uh, in this pandemic uh, transition. Um, and I think if we think beyond COVID-19, hopefully this will soon be behind us. And we think about the shifting world, the transitioning world that we're all aiming for. Um, I think hydrocarbons will still play a major role in this uh, societal uh, transformation. Um, you know, just think about cars. So I mentioned that I'm trying to improve the competitiveness of cars to reduce their mm -hmm. emissions, right? right? But why don't we go one step further and look at the components of a car? And this kind of draws us into, you know, this, this world of polymers. So um, about 50% of a car is made of um, some shape, way, or form of a plastic content. Mm -hmm. um, we think that this plastic content can be increased. And with increasing the plastic content, uh, the vehicle's weight is reduced, its efficiency, combustion efficiency is, is also improved, and hence it emits uh, less. So when you reduce the weight of a vehicle, you're actually improving its efficiency. You can do the same with an EV. You can optimize and create more efficiencies for a, 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 an EV um, vehicle. Um, and part of that is also identifying uh, advanced polymer materials that can go into the next generation of vehicles that are on the horizon. Um, if you also think about, you know, I mentioned the example of airplanes and how you can lightweight an airplane mm -hmm. um, and improve its efficiency. Uh, you can do the same thing with a ship. Uh, you can work with uh, the hull to create a, 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 an alter a polymeric alternative or a polymer alternative that is actually um, uh, much more efficient uh, than mm -hmm. steel or aluminum or, or any other conventional material. Right. Um, but I want to actually zoom in a little bit on some of the benefits that we've seen as a program when we did this comparison and and this is again the beauty of what we're trying to do in OSP. Mm -hmm. So if I draw your attention to the construction sector, mm -hmm. think about wood, steel, glass, 
concrete, cement, and think about all of those uh, elements globally, right. right? And if I told you that there is a maybe five, six percent, <clears throat> excuse me, hydrocarbon, um, uh, five or six percent of hydrocarbons enter into the construction material, you'd be like, oh, I didn't know that. At least I didn't know that when we were doing our assessment. <laughs> But for me, there is an opportunity for substitution. And right. why am I thinking about this? And why am I really considering it as a program? It's because we want to innovate the way hydrocarbons are being utilized. We don't want to continue just focusing on combusting the hydrocarbon for a mode of transportation. Or, you know, let's let's just burn this this um, hydrocarbon to produce this um, you know benefit for us as mm -hmm. We want to innovate. So we want to actually take hydrocarbons or oil into more durable applications. So Shelby, these are things that you don't see anymore. This is the road that you're driving on. This is the bridge. Uh, this is the, the polycarbonate facade of a building instead of glass. Um, and, and this is a, you know, a polymer pipe versus a steel yeah. pipe, which you guys probably in NOV oh, are yeah. more familiar with. <laughs> Uh, so these are th this is kind of the, the the mindset that we are in as a program. We're trying to shift the uh, you know normal way of considering and interacting with oil and innovating how we uh, utilize oil um, now and in the future. And and a big chunk of our efforts is really focused on this space of advanced and sustainable construction materials. And, you know, I want to give you a few, you know, examples just to make that connection. So if we look at uh, glass fiber reinforced polymer or high density polyethylene pipes, and we compare those to steel, and then you look at the, um, um, the life cycle energy uh, consumption for each, mm -hmm. and you do that comparison, you'll notice that the polymer alternative actually has a lower uh, life cycle mm -hmm. consumption versus steel. Um, Right. The individual right. consumer may not know that. Um, uh, you know, another thing that uh, you know we also look at if you add, if you combine polymer with concrete, for example, a solution that we have and we've been looking at is polymer concrete or polymer in concrete. Mm -hmm. That this displacing uh, the amount of concrete with uh, an X percent of polymer, you can achieve almost nine to ten percent uh, CO two reductions. You may think to yourself, hey, that's not a big number. But if you actually consider the amount of construction that happens globally, uh, the amount of concrete that's used all over the world, and in aggregate, oh, yeah. take that 9 10% reduction globally, uh, you're really creating a lot of breakthroughs. Um, so again, this is carbon that is not being emitted. This is carbon that is durable in an application that um, are infrastructure heavy. Um, and that's kind of what we are reorienting ourselves um, uh, in. Another thing to highlight, we use hydrocarbons for insulation, for example, foam. So you can use <laughs> foam to insulate a building, right? And if you use foam versus uh, other alternative, I, I'm not going to pick on other alternatives. <laughs> uh, there is an advantage. You are creating more efficiency. When the building is more efficient, it's emitting less. Right. Uh, and, and these are types of efforts that we're trying to do within the program and working with uh, the major stakeholders that we have in the kingdom to try and drive that uh, message through. Um, if you also think about the conversion, so if I'm thinking about conversion or manufacturing of mm -hmm. um, uh, HDPE pipe versus steel pipe, uh, the emission that comes from steel is actually higher than the HDP alternative. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just giving you, you know, it, these are just simple examples, right. you know, maybe I'm oversimplifying, but I just want to bring your attention that consumers may not realize that the conventional materials that they are using actually have an environmental footprint that needs to be considered as well. If you know, something as simple as weight, if you transport steel versus transporting polymer, what what is heavier? The steel is heavier, the steel will consume uh, more fuel when it's being transported from point A to point B. You have an advantage when you are transporting polymer uh, versus steel. And, and, and you know, the list goes on. So why am I t giving you these examples? It's because it's in our DNA as a program. This is my mandate. My mandate is to make sure that I'm driving the sustainability angle mm -hmm. as much as I'm driving anything else. 
Um, and you need to be very innovative in that approach because um, if you go to a construction company, they don't want to deal with a unique advanced material that they've never dealt with before. Right. They're happy with wood, they're happy with steel, they're happy with the <laughs> conventional. You have to really work very closely with these construction companies and design offices and, and you know multiple stakeholders and it's 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 a journey because you need to convince them to adopt and when they adopt you have to show them what is the environmental footprint advantage for the materials that I am promoting and I think create an advantage and and I'm happy to say we've been relatively uh, you know I'll say relatively because it's still a journey but we've been relatively successful in convincing uh, major projects uh, in the kingdom uh, about what we're trying to to work on in terms of our advanced uh, polymer based construction materials and they are seeing the advantages uh, don't forget you also have to look at it from the lens of the kingdom and the region mm -hmm. and where you are in the world some parts of the world don't have uh, you know some materials some parts of the world have but we have an abundance of resources that we need to leverage to help us get to the next level sustainably again mm -hmm. um, and one last thing you know on this topic that I think is also important and I, I really like to um, you know bring you towards the consumer um, if you think about you know packaging in general so uh, food packaging you know, food packaging creates a lot of hygienic advantages. The the sanitary aspect of packaging food, I know we're, we're probably more fortunate, but there are parts of the world that don't have, um, you know, that luxury. Mm -hmm. And it's really a lifesaver for some parts of the world. But the issue is, is once you consume what's in the package and you dispose of the package, that's a problem. So again, why can't we create um, an ecosystem to address the recyclability of packaging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if is paper better? Uh, paper will end up also has to go through a biodegra biodegradability uh, mm -hmm. journey as well. Right. And, and you right. know, the, the those debates have to happen and those discussions have to happen. But I'm not saying, and we as a program are not saying this is wrong and this is right. You'll always see us working very collaboratively with both sides of the coin. Um, mm -hmm. And we love having these what I call positive tension discussions. Yeah. You, it's really exciting because sometimes when when people when you say something and people's eyes just light up and they're like, oh, we didn't realize that this was really happening or we didn't really know that this, um, uh, you know, this is something that actually oil was contributing to the sustainability uh, aspect. And, and these this is you will see me always speaking about this in a very passionate way because I truly believe in it. And it's a conversation I have with my daughters. Um, mm -hmm. They, they today's generation uh, may have a different uh, mindset than my generation. Uh, but what I know is that whether we decide on option A or option B, I think both options need to live together and need to be part of our journey to whatever that second or next gener you know, destination will be. Um, and I'll always be driving uh, towards that collaboratively uh, with anybody and anybody who has that interest and the same, you know, uh, passion about the sector. Absolutely. And I think it's so interesting you talked about that that um, positive tension there because I'll, I'll pick on construction as well. I worked in a construction technology prior to NOV and my dad's in the industry, so I grew up around it. So I'll, I'll pick on them too for a minute. But yeah, you, you mentioned sometimes there is that kind of obstacle of, of working and, and a lot of times it comes down to that kind of economic bottom line and and as you've mentioned that's also something that y'all are taking into consideration and showing them like you said with the closed loop system how it can be economically be beneficial and environmentally beneficial and I think that's that's going to be such a key part to getting all of these uh, other industries kind of on the, on the team so to speak. Um, and, and I also wanted to ask you, so um, NOV and OSP has a collaboration and partnership. Um, can you talk about a little bit about the example of, uh, of that, of, of kind of examples of these collaborations that, that reach towards um, a more sustainable environmental and economic uh, efficiency? Uh, thank you for that question, mm -hmm. Shelby. You know, um, the first time I met Clay, uh, he, it was a, a short visit uh, in Kingdom. Um, I had the the privilege to to have um, a, a very fruitful meeting with him and and the, the NOV team that was visiting and also the 
the NOV, you know, team in Saudi Arabia. And I was really, you know, fascinated uh, by, you know, that meeting that we had with Clay. And then the fascination continued when we went for dinner uh, together. Uh, when you see an individual that really understands mm -hmm. the importance of hydrocarbons uh, and really understands how hydrocarbons can actually uh, contribute to your sustainability message, um, you really, I, I think we developed a connection immediately. Um, and I, I, I think one fundamental thing that we were really keen on working with NOV, and I'll just highlight a couple of things and, and, and maybe just to reflect on. Uh, first of all, the openness, mm -hmm. uh, the transparency, and we had similar pain points. We both cared about the sector and we both wanted to do things in a very sustainable point of view. And NOV's experience in non-metallics, specifically in oil and gas, we saw that as a great uh, resource. But what we also wanted NOV to do with us is, you know, you guys have some great technology capability and appetite to explore things. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take NOV's uh, capability and try to consider some of the applications we are working for and specifically mm -hmm. in the construction sector? So right. why can't NOV's non-metallic capability transcend uh, beyond oil and gas? Mm -hmm. And I think that that discussion with Clay uh, really resonated and, and we were thinking, you know, uh, very innovatively of different ideas that we, we were working on. Um, one aspect is expanding NOV's footprint uh, in the kingdom, where we are working with all the major stakeholders to um, promote the adoption of non-metallic uh, solutions, particularly in the oil and gas and beyond. And that's what we're really doing with, with our counterparts in the kingdom. And as you probably interacted with uh, uh, our team, our OSP team that's working on uh, policy and awareness um, uh, here in, in OSP, and what they want to do is try to create the right awareness on the importance of increasing the adoption of polymer materials in, in the different segments that I've highlighted. And we are leveraging NOV's experience technically and in also your experience in creating that awareness. Um, and, and the hope is, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I tell I tell the team always, what is the next uh, version of the relationship? Where do we right. want to go uh, beyond that? So one thing that we want to really explore is I want to create excitement in the kingdom. And I'm again, I'm focusing on the kingdom here. Right. I want to create excitement in the kingdom about non-metallics. So how can I, you know, create programs with NOV's presence in the kingdom and, and inspire, you know, children who are sco in school uh, to get interested in the space. How can I get college students who are thinking about their, you know, degree or their master's degree? You know, how do I get them into material science and 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 try to work with them on creating that excitement um, uh, to join a very challenging sector with a lot of mm -hmm. exciting opportunities? And that's one thing that we really want to work with you guys on, uh, leveraging your experience. Um, and, and I think, you know, a good example is what I'm doing with you here. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, I, I, I really appreciate um, NOV's passion and it's a similar passion that we have. I really appreciate, you know, your your ability to innovate with us. Um, and, and, you know, there was nothing that I uh, asked Clay and he said, no, we can't do. He said, Let, let's look at it and let's explore it. Right. And that's really the spirit that I, I think I connected with. And I, and I hope next time he's he's here in town, we, I'd love to always, I know he's always a busy guy, um, uh, but I I've ha only have the, the utmost respect for him and for the NOV team uh, and for what they've been uh, doing with us. And and you will see soon uh, sooner or later us doing more collaborative uh, efforts with you guys, whether it's on the technical side or on the um, awareness um, and, and advocacy uh, aspect as well. Yeah, I agree. And thank you so much for, for saying all of that about NOV. Um, I agree from, from working in it, that's, that's the feeling I get from here. I'm really, really proud of that. And, and like you said, I'm, I'm also very passionate about getting people excited. That's something we talk on the show all the time. We get questions from the audience or, or I like to ask our guests and stuff around, you know, what, how can we get people more excited? So it's great to hear you say that. And I think a lot of what we've talked about today, I mean, it's gotten me excited. I think I could talk 
for hours about all of this, um, but I do wanna be conscious of our audience that's watching. I think we have a few questions from them. So while we still have time, I wanted to head back over to Ben. Ben, what's what's the happenings online? Yeah, yeah, we've got some questions. Um, this is uh, th this has been really great and informative, and I can tell that you're really emotional yeah. about this. Um, if we don't get to your question, then you know you can you can send an, uh, an email, uh, social media at nob.com, and we'll make sure to mm -hmm. to answer it. But my first question is actually my own question, and I can do that because I'm sitting here. Um, <laughs> do, you, do do you have you mentioned your opportunities, and you and I love the 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 way you reframe that from challenges to opportunities. But do you have maybe a favorite or a biggest or most impactful opportunity that you're working on? Well, that's a really good question. Um, uh, does it have to be one? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so so I'll, I'll give you a few. Uh, one that I really am am, am passionate about. It's um, actually working um, on availing a clean cooking solution. Mm -hmm. So this is so there's a, a you know there's a a big ch you know big part of the population that still use um uh, wood and biomass uh for their cooking needs and i don't know if you guys knew this but you know it's it's the numbers in the billions wow. um and these households uh unfortunately when they go and spend time procuring the wood uh that takes time out of their days where they can actually do something more uh, beneficial to their economic uh, well-being mm -hmm. um also when you burn wood or burn biomass the stuff that comes out uh, or the fumes that come out are very detrimental to your health. So one thing, and, and you know, I don't know if you guys um, are aware about it, is th there is a, a cleaner uh, cooking solution that we've been exploring, uh, which is actually using uh, LPG, uh, liquefied petroleum gas. And the idea was um, you actually create uh, the infrastructure where you replace uh, wood, and biomass with uh, the LPG alternative. And we're working with major um, entities that are supporting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and this is just something that I always reflect on. I get sometimes emotional about it because I had different discussions with some, some people in other parts of the world where this is a real big issue. Uh, and us having this resource uh, that is actually cleaner and creates a, a cleaner, uh, solution than wood and biomass is something that we are fundamentally uh, very passionate about working on. Another you know thing that I'm very is, is very near and dear to my heart is mobility. So vehicles. Um, I, I like the, the the opportunity to improve um, the internal combustion engine today. I like engines. I like things that are um, mechanical uh, and I think there are a lot of things that you can do, and a lot, and I think there's a lot of excitement that you can create around improving um, uh, vehicles today. So I, I think those two I always talk about. You know, I'm very biased to the material opportunities because, you know, when you think about, um, you know, I mentioned um, ice competitiveness, jet fuel competitiveness, but also if you think about the substitution of of materials, like the example I told you, Shelby, about the the reusable plastic uh, right. package, that concept. Um, just you know, really resonated with me because I was uh, it was an aha moment, and we were when we were right. starting to think of ideas like that, uh, you really start connecting with them because everybody orders orders things online. These are things that you really, but you don't really realize that okay, what happens with this cardboard box or this cardboard packaging once it's gone? Right. What about trying to create an alternative, uh, trying to create a a closed loop system around it? So you know, I hope that. That's a good answer to to your question. Yeah, I think so. And it's like you said, there those opportunities are are really all around us. They're all those things that we don't notice every day. All right, what else you got? Ben? Yeah, in in that same vein. So th this this was a great question we got online. With your perspective and experience in these green initiatives, are there any other lifestyle choices you would recommend to consumers besides recycling plastics? Things you can do mm -hmm. in your daily life. Hmm. Well, the uh, I guess the the overall concept of um, I don't want to say ration you know rationing your life but consume less um, you know if you right. think about uh, an efficiency and if, if you are more efficient when you're constructing a building you're insulating better you're 
you know, your heat loss, cooling loss is addressed. And you just take that concept of efficiency and you put it on yourself, um, where you try in your household to be more efficient in terms of what appliances you're using, what insulation in your house you have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we have initiatives in the kingdom where we actually are trying to find more uh, efficient air conditioners because there are a lot of air conditioning that's required in the kingdom during the summer times. Um, so there are actually higher efficiency air conditioners. This was a government mm -hmm. program launched by our uh, Saudi Energy Efficiency Center um, to roll out these air conditioners to different households that needed them. Uh, so I think things like that, when you when you think about, for example, um, making a decision whether you want to consume more or consume less, I think consuming less will try to will definitely reduce your overall carbon footprint as an individual. Uh, but it's really that awareness. I mean, we have to start understanding that we don't live in silos as individuals. We are part of a community. And part of my uh, background is uh, this concept of systems thinking. So we are all part of a system and there are interlinking uh, interactions in everywhere in the system. So whether it's a healthcare system, uh, you know, uh, uh, or any other system, there are multiple interconnections that uh, affect and um, interact with each other. So I think once you start realizing that and more people adopt kind of that thinking overall, hopefully you should um, achieve less emissions as as a people. That's my personal view. That's great. That was a great answer. One more. One more. But I more? think we have time. We'll do one more. All right. Um, so this was another question online. Where do you position hydrogens uh, among other means like, uh, you know, electric vehicles and transitioning in the transportation sector in the next 10 to 15 years? Hydrogen? Mm -hmm. I think hydrogen is, the, the, you know, the next big uh, fuel for us uh, as a kingdom. Uh, we're looking at uh, blue and green. We have big efforts and big investments on both. We're also considering hydrogen infrastructure. So think about instead of a gas station, a hydrogen fueling station. Uh, we think it's a transition fuel that is um, very viable. And we have the right resources and ecosystem in the kingdom to um, uh, work on deploying um, hydrogen. And we have a major effort in the Ministry uh, of Energy to push uh, you know, the agenda and the strategic direction of hydrogen uh, from now until uh, 2030 and beyond. So, yes, mm -hmm. it is a very important fuel for us, and there's a lot of effort now working on it. And as I mentioned, green and blue hydrogen are both on, on the table, and multiple stakeholders are working on that. Absolutely. And I, and I think we do have an episode, um, if you go back a little, might be a little deep in the archives on NOV.com slash live, but I think we did do an episode on, on the difference and kind of uh, between blue and green hydrogen. Uh, so if that if that viewer is interested. Um, but with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming on the show today, Mohammed. I think this was eye-opening for me. I'm, I'm sure it was eye-opening for a lot of our viewers as well. And um, like I said, I, I really could talk forever, but we'll, well, I think we'll end it here. We might just have to have you back on another time, but thank you so much Shel for your time today. Shelby, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank NOV and the NOV Life team for this opportunity. Just want to have, make a shout out for my daughters, Jawahir, Lulua, and Sultana. I know they're watching. I just found out they're watching. So uh, miss you guys. And, and thank you again. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Likewise here. And, and thank you for watching. We're here every week on Wednesdays. Uh, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you for joining.